have with us the most distinguished guest, Dr. John De Martini. He is a renowned human behavior specialist, leadership and success strategist, internationally published author, and a thought author authority on maximizing human awareness and potential. As a revered chiropractor and an international authority on the mind-body connection, with a background of over 40 years in-depth study covering over 260 ologies, with a primary focus on health, disease, healing, and the well-being, he is here today to speak to us on mind over body, addressing your true hidden agendas and unconscious motives related to your physical body. Dr. Martini is a renowned human behavioral specialist, and we're so happy to have him here with us today. Thank you. <clears throat> Make sure I have this uh, on. <clears throat> I guess I'll stand, yes? <laughs> if you want to use that audio, yeah, I'll, I'll just do it because I'm going to maybe draw on here. Well, this is uh, a great opportunity, so thank you for having me here. I, um, I'm curious, did you come here because of the topic or because you're curious of what I might say? Both. Okay. Just, uh, just topic. Topic, because I've, I've asked that before and sometimes they don't come for the topic, they just come for what, what I have to say. Just curious. <clears throat> um, I have about, am I correct, about 30 to 45 minutes? Yes. Okay. And then, um, so you want questions at the end, preferably, because I was just informed about 30 to 45 minutes. This is a broad topic and I sometimes spend days on this, so it's, it's gonna be very interesting to try to bring this down into 30 to 40 minutes. <clears throat> I have been fascinated by the art of wellness and the healing arts for over 40 years, and particularly the mind-body relationship. I would consider myself an applied physiologist, somebody who's dedicated to the application of physiology as it relates to clinical cases. <clears throat> I work with people that have psychological conditions and also physiological conditions. But um, I've been fascinated by what it is that allows people to maximize their full potential. And wellness is part of the full potential experience. <coughs> so I'd like to develop that. Um, I don't know if I can do it justice without having a preliminary introduction to an ology called axiology. So pardon my development of this, but I, I feel that it's probably the wisest way to approach it. <clears throat> and hopefully you can see this. I haven't used this marker yet, so I'm assuming that it's visible. <clears throat> Every individual, regardless of race, creed, color, age, or sex, lives by a set of priorities, a set of values that they make decisions by. Things that are most important to least important in their life. So I'm gonna draw those. I don't know if it's visible, probably not. Let's see if we can try a different marker. There we go. A set of priorities in their life. The highest priority, I'll call HP, or the highest value, or the thing that's most important, I'll put at the top. And down below, I'll put down less priority, less value, or lower value, and least important in their life. <clears throat> no two people have the same set of priorities, same set of values. They're fingerprint specific, they're unique, retinal pattern specific, voice pattern specific. No two people have the same uh, values on life and therefore they filter their reality completely different. <clears throat> Whatever's highest on the value, uh, the ancient Greeks called the telos. The telos was the end in mind, the chief aim, the thing that was most important to them. <clears throat> the ancient Greeks knew this was important to identify this and made a whole study out of it. And they called it teleology, the study of meaning and purpose. So whatever's highest on a person's value is the thing that's most meaningful to them and most purposeful to them and the most fulfilling to them. And each person has a unique, thank you, has a unique um, priority in their life. And as such, they're directed into their own destiny, their own direction. 
whatever's highest on their value, they are inspired from within to fulfill. That means they require no outside motivation to do what's most important to them. Just like a, a young boy who's 12 years old who likes video games, nobody has to remind him to do his video games. He's inspired from within to get up and do his video games. But for myself, I teach every day. Hopefully you can hear me, yeah. I teach every day, I'm a teacher. I teach somewhere between 350 and 400 speeches a year on average. So I'm full-time in 60 countries a year speaking. So nobody has to get me up in the morning. Somehow this is going off. Um, hopefully this is still on. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's on Yeah. Nobody has to remind me to do my speaking. I love doing it. So whatever is highest on your value, thank you. You love doing. It's inspired from within. But as you go down the list of values, you require outside motivation to get you to work. So motivation is literally an extrinsic system where you require outside motivation. And inspiration is something from within. It's intrinsic. So when you live congruently in alignment with your highest values, you are inspired from within to do what's most meaningful to you. And when you do, you have the most fulfillment. But when you are attempting to live according to lower values, you need motivations and reminders to get you to do things. When you're living according to your highest values, therefore you're disciplined, you're reliable, and you're focused, you're inspired from within, you're spontaneous, and you bring order and organization in life, and you identify yourself by that. Whatever is highest on your value, you tend to identify yourself by. For instance, if you're a mother with three beautiful children under the age of five, and um, your highest value is those children, if somebody asks you, who are you, you will say, I'm a mother. But if you're a business leader, and you're an entrepreneur, and your highest value is um, beautiful children, or not beautiful children, but beautiful businesses, um, you'll say, I'm an entrepreneur, a business leader. So your ontology, your being, will be identified by this highest value. And your teleology, your purpose, will be identified by this highest value. And you knowing yourself, your epistemology, will be identified by this highest value. So who you are, what you do, who, what you live, and your purpose are all revolved around this highest value. The study of values is a study of axiology, the study of values and worth. So this whole thing is really an axiological study. This hierarchy of values, this structure of values, is called the value structure or the hierarchy of values by some writers. Now, this is important because it affects physiology, and I'm going to come back to physiology, but I have to build this foundation first. <clears throat> Whenever you're going and living according to lower values, you tend to procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate. You have disorder and disorganization, and you tend to disown this area of your life. You don't like to be identified by your lower values. This is the area that you don't get around to doing, you have a lot of chaos and disorder around it, so you kind of disown that part. So your identity is, revolves around your highest value, but you tend to disown the things that are lower on your values. Now, in your areas of your highest values, you tend to endure both pleasure and pain equally. That means something that's really, really, really important to you, that's really high on your values, you'll endure pain or pleasure in the pursuit of it. So if your highest value is raising a child, even if the child vomits, is sick, doesn't get you sleep, uh, scratches you, fights with you, you still love the child because it's your highest value. The same thing with the business owner. Even though there's lots of challenges and lots of chaos trying to run a business, they love it, they pursue it, they endure pain and pleasure in the pursuit of it. But something that's low on your values, you won't do it if it's painful. You'll need outside motivation to keep you doing it. So down below, you tend to do it if it's pleasurable, but you tend to not do it if it's painful. So as you go and live by your highest value, you activate what I call the more authentic self, the more inspired self. Uh, some people in a theological language will call it the angelic self, the more illuminated self. 
But if you live according to your lowest value, you'll activate your animal self. Here you live by your mission, and here you live by what we could call the animal passion. The animal passion is the impulse for pleasure, or prey, and the instinct from pain, or predator. Now the animal nature wants to avoid pain and seek pleasure. It's seeking that which is unavailable, and it's trying to avoid that which is unavoidable. But the higher self, when we live by our higher values, we tend to embrace both sides of life. The truth is that life has both sides. It has pleasure and pain. And so anytime we're pursuing something and we have an expectation of one-sidedness, we set ourselves up for self-defeating. We're setting ourselves for kind of a one-sided world. So <clears throat> whenever we are living congruently in alignment with our highest values, we embrace the two sides of life and we tend to have realistic expectations and we tend to achieve because we're inspired from within, we're disciplined, reliable, and focused, and we'll embrace pain and pleasure in the pursuit of it. And so we end up having more of a leader manifestation here, and we tend to be more of a follower in this direction. So one of the keys in manifesting our highest potential is to identify what is really truly most important to us as an individual and fulfill our lives accordingly. Anytime we set goals that are according to the ABCs, a priority, we tend to expand ourselves, and anytime we live by lower priorities, we tend to constrict ourselves. People who set goals that are aligned with the highest values tend to expand their space and time horizons and give themselves permission to do greater things. Because they set a goal, they accomplish it, they tend to set a bigger goal, and they want to accomplish more over a longer period of time. So this tends to awaken up our angelic, immortal self, and this tends to awaken up our mortal animal self, if you will. So we have, in a sense, an expanded consciousness or constricted consciousness. Here we tend to have an embracing of the balance of life. Here we tend to look for that which is unavoidable, unavailable and try to avoid that which is unavoidable. And therefore we end up frustrated about life or un ungrateful for life because we're striving for that which is unobtainable and trying to avoid that which is unavoidable, which makes us ungrateful and feel futility. So in this direction, we become a master of our destiny. This direction, we become a victim of our history. Majority of people on the planet are striving uh, for a one-sided world. They want ease without difficulty. They want uh, a magnet that's one-sided, and they bang their head against the wall searching for that which is unavailable and not embracing life as it is. Would you agree that you've met people look looking for a one-sided world? <clears throat> now, how does this relate to physiology? Let's, uh, let's take that and imagine me flipping a piece of paper here, and I'll have to draw it because I don't have another piece of paper, and I don't want to not draw that page yet, or use that page. Anytime we're going through life, we have both supporters and challengers in our life. People that, that have similar values and people that have dissimilar values. The people that are similar to us, um, when we see more similarities and differences, we tend to attract. When we see more differences and similarities, we tend to repel. The supporter is like a prey we like, the, the challenger is like the predator that we tend to dislike. Anything that supports our values, we tend to look up to. Anything that challenges our values, we tend to look down upon. When it supports our values, um, we tend to open up to them, and we want to let them in. When it challenges our values, we tend to close down on them, and we want to keep them out. We have a natural tendency to open and close according to things that support and challenge our values. Now, what does that do with our brain? We have in our brain uh, a specialized nerve cells, um, and we also have glial cells. Glial cells, there's six basic ones, and they come in many subtypes, and they are outnumber the nerve cells anywhere from one to one to 10 to one, depending on the type. And these glial cells respond to our values. And these glial cells are literally neuroplastically remodeling the brain and literally rebuilding and destroying the brain constantly. Anything that helps you fulfill your highest values, anything you sense or act upon that helps you fulfill your highest values, uh, the glial cells will myelinate, bring nutrition to it, help neurogenically build neurons and um, prune away anything else to make sure the brain is maximizing the fulfillment of its highest values. 
Anything that is not perceived as fulfilling its highest values, both through sensory awareness and motor activities, it will automatically demyelinate and literally cause a apoptosis and a destruction of the neurons and literally remodel the brain because the brain is an organ designed to help you fulfill your highest values, to have fulfillment. And the brain, the central nervous system, is the master governor and controller of the physiology. So that means the neurons in the brain uh, are responding indirectly through the glial cells to our value system and are therefore neuroplastically remodeling themselves and building and destroying themselves in order to make sure that we maximize our full potential. And our full potential is experiencing by living according to our highest values. Now, I'm trying to say a lot in 30 minutes, so bear with me. <laughs> I have a, usually a whole five-day course on the more details of this. I, I wrote a textbook that's about 900 pages on 1,000 health conditions, the underlying psychology of these things. So I'm having to be brief. Now, here's the beauty of it. Underneath this central nervous system and in a more primitive part of the nervous system, we have an autonomic nervous system. This autonomic nervous system is connected through the reticular activating system to the higher brain stems, right brain systems, and it responds to that which supports our values or challenges our values. So anything that supports our values, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve predominantly, and the sacral nerves. And anything that challenges our values, it creates the fight or flight mechanism with the sympathetic nervous system. So one is acetylcholine and one is basically norepinephrine. And anything that supports the values also activates dopamine, encephalons, endorphins, oxytocin, and serotonin in the brain and creates an addictive desire for something, a bonding mechanism, a pleasure something, and a surreal fantasy about these things. And anything that challenges it creates substance P and prolactin and creates a norepinephrine and cortisol and other neurotransmitters that tend to move away from it that's painful. So anything that supports our values activates the parasympathetic. Anything that support, challenges the values activates the sympathetic side. These two primary systems um, are correlated and influence the cells of the body. Regardless of the cell type, it's influencing. We pretty well have found receptor sites for the autonomic nervous system in pretty well every cell. And even the mobile cells or the white blood cells have receptor sites for them, for the transmitters. Now. If something supports our values and we activate the parasympathetic, that neurotransmitter released from the parasympathetic literally goes down to the cell and does something quite unique. So pardon me for having to redraw this page or use this page again, because sometimes I use a flip chart in a little small group like this. But so let me draw that. So let's imagine that you have your, your values up here and anything that supports the values, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Anything that challenges the highest value is activating the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic is uh, primarily a nighttime active system. It deals with rest uh, and digestion. And this is primarily a daytime because this deals with the challenges of the day. This is basically a fight or flight mechanism. The parasympathetic system deals with um, reduction. This one deals with oxidation in the physiology. This is a builder. It's anabolic. This is a destroyer. This is catabolic. This one literally creates a mitotic aspects to cells. And this one creates an apop uh, destruction of the cells. This deals with primarily white blood cells, WBCs, and repair. This does with RBCs for oxidation during the day. So there's basically an autonomic balancing mechanism here. If these two, if you're living by your highest values, you tend to bring these into equilibrium because you embrace support and challenge equally. If you are living by your lowest values and you're striving for one and trying to avoid the other, you tend to bring these into disequilibrium. When you create a disequilibrium, you create symptomatology because each of these uh, sides of the autonomic create different physiological responses. The parasympathetic, for instance, its transmitter, we'll just call it acetyl-CoA. This transmitter, we'll call norepinephrine. This acetyl-CoA basically goes down to a cell and literally goes to a receptor site on a cell and activates what they call cyclic GMP, which is a cytosine guano monophosphate. And what it does, it literally, with the calmodulin mo molecule, creates a series 
of enzymatic pathways called phosphatase. This one goes down, activates another receptor site, causes cyclic AMP to be activated, and calmodulin, and basically creates a kinase pathway. It goes into the nucleus of the cell through a little series of cascading enzymes and goes here and methylates it on this side and acetylates the histones and DNA of the cell and cause a transcription of the DNA uh, through an epigenetic pathway and alters gene expression and alters function and structure of proteins that are manufactured, which then turn on and turn off and facilitate and inhibit cell functions. So all that's kind of a fancy uh, directive, but basically what's being said is that your emotions, the things that support your values that make you happy or elated, and things that challenge your values which make you sad or depressed, can affect your physiology through epigenetics, can alter your physiology, and literally change various disease patterns. Now, I've been fascinated by these patterns for 40 years plus, and have been analyzing these things and asking questions to people with various conditions that most people don't take the time to ask. The histories are not thorough, and therefore, they're basically um, not getting information. Now, I'm gonna step up for a second, go back to the page before. Every decision we make is based on what we believe gives us the greatest advantage over disadvantage at any moment in our time with our value system. So if we're making a decision to do something, it's because we believe at that moment that there's gonna be more advantages there than disadvantages, we wouldn't do it based on all the variables that we have in our awareness. So if we're creating a physiological response and we're seeing more support than challenge or challenge than support, we wouldn't do that unless we got an advantage out of it, deep inside. We wouldn't keep that perception, even though many people would think we won't. Let me give you an example. I had a woman who is uh, filming for a reality TV show in Hollywood that I was doing, and she um, was obese and was uh, grazing and eating food constantly. In fact, in the two hours that I interacted with her, she ate more food than I probably eat in a week. And, um, but she was telling me that she wanted to lose weight and she, couldn't, she had to stop eating and she was obese and she was sick and she was tired of it and she had to stop, and, but she, had, she was eating. So even though what she was saying verbally was one thing, consciously, but unconsciously she had another agenda going on. And the decision she was making that was causing her motor functions of eating was based on what she actually felt deep inside was more advantage and disadvantage or she wouldn't be doing it. So I went in there and I asked her a simple question. What advantages are you getting out of eating? And she said, oh, I'm not, it's killing me. Can't you see it's causing my problems? It's causing this, it's causing that. I said, no, I, I know that, I hear that, but that's not what I know is true. So I know I'm gonna ask you the question again. What are the benefits you're getting out of eating? And she said, well, there are no benefits. I said, I understand, I hear that, but I need you to go deeper. But I can't think of any benefits. I need you to go deeper. So what's the benefits of eating? And so she said, well, when now that you've probed me and pushed me, one of the benefits is my mother and father and sisters are all obese. And if I don't eat, I don't feel like I'm part of my family. And now it came a tear in her eye. Now at first you would not probably guess that, but that's what we found, the first thing. I said, so what's another benefit? We kept probing and kept probing and she said, well another benefit is my sister's bigger than me and she used to push me around as a child and I swore I didn't want her pushing me around, so I ate and got bigger than her so she couldn't push me around. And now I'm bigger than her. I've always maintained I'm bigger than her so she doesn't push me around because she's always telling me what to do and push me around. So I guess there's another benefit is that she can't push me around when I eat. Good, another, another benefit. Well, since I've been a, a larger, if I lose weight and go on fast, fasting and diets, um, I end up having sagging skin. And I like my smooth skin because people always remark on my skin, but if I lose weight, I get saggy skin. I don't like that, so I make sure I eat to keep my skin smooth. Okay, that's three. Number, number four benefit. Well, then she said, well, this, this is one that I didn't do, and she started crying. She says, well, uh, the last time I went on a diet and lost a bunch of weight and started having a figure, a, a guy came on to me and showed a, affection for me. And I, first time I had ever had a man show affection for me. When I did, I thought that he loved me. But the true truth is he was just wanting uh, sexual favor. So what happened is I, I, um, I was vulnerable to that and I ended up making love with him. And in the process of doing that, I, I ended up getting pregnant. And then I found out when I told him that he disappeared and I never saw him again. And I was now in an internal turmoil about this. So I swore after that 
I had a miscarriage on the baby, but I swore that I would never do that again. So I made sure that I didn't lose weight to make sure that I didn't become attractive to prevent that pain of that experience. Are you with me on this? So anyway, we went through and believe it or not, in the two hours we end up with 70 something different benefits that she didn't know she had. Then she went home that night and she came up with another something 70 benefits. And the next morning she came in, she says, I really don't have any intention of losing weight, do I? And I said, no, you don't. So even though you say you wanna lose weight, because of social idealisms and expectations that people have imposed on you and all the things you've read from the outside world, deep inside you unconsciously have a motive to maintain your weight. So her physiology was responding to her experiences of wounds in the past and her perceptions and causing her to keep eating. Raise your hand if you can follow what I'm saying so far. So the unconscious motive was overriding what was the consciousness. So people say one thing but unconsciously have another thing. I'll give you another example. I had a lady that had diabetes. They wheeled her into my office many years ago. And um, she had uh, ulcerative legs and she had blindness developing and she was having neuropathies and peripheral neuropathies and breaking down of some of the tissues in her body and things were failing on her. And um, I had had some very amazing results with people who were willing to do the work, willing to do exercise and change their diet and do things. It was slowing down and, and in a sense impeding some of the development of the diabetic symptoms. So I told her that I would be able to help her. I really felt it, but she would have a, quite an ordeal to work on. And she'd have to do some activities and she'd have to eat differently, have to think differently and lots of other factors. And she looked at me and she says, I have no intention of doing that. Um, I know you believe you can help me, but I have no intention of getting well. I'm getting uh, medical coverage, insurance coverage by being sick, but I just go to doctors to try to find somebody that tell me this to, in order to keep getting my coverage. I have no intention of getting well, so thank you for believing in me, but I have no intention of doing that. And she said, that lady out there that wheels me around, she's been with me for eight years. She's my closest confidant. She loves me. She knows everything about my life. She's the closest person in my life. If I get out of my wheelchair and I, I walk around and go back to normal life again, I lose the most important person in my life. So she had a motive not to get well. Anybody that's been in the healthcare knows you see these types of situations where people really don't have the intention of doing what your ideal is. They have deeper motives in doing it. But my observation is this. After going through and working with hundreds of people that had diabetes, I found personality types in diabetics. And in case some of you are diabetic here, you relate to this. Uh, anybody here worked with diabetics before? If you know when you work with diabetics, it's very difficult it is to tell them what to do. A diabetic is somebody, if you tell them what to do, they have their own viewpoints on how to do things and you have to make them think it's their decisions in order for them to do it. But on the other kind, the hype, that's the one side of the blood sugar axis. The other one is the hypoglycemic. The hypoglycemic, you can tell them what to do and they'll do almost anything you tell them because they're playing another side. We found out that, that when somebody feels, perceives that their life has been challenged and they're on defense and they have a sympathetic activity and they're ready for oxidative systems and they're on defense like that, they go into a self-righteous mode and tend to tell people what to do and project. The diabetic is the one that's ready for the fight or flight mechanism inside and is basically playing the self-righteous persona. And they're basically a defensing mechanism, which is a sign that they've got a defense mechanism inside them and they're holding on to that defense mechanism. The hypoglycemic is the one that's pleasing everybody and they're infatuated with people and they're minimizing themselves to other people and their blood sugar goes down because they're basically the passive side. You can tell them what to do and they'll do it. They're not into fighting. The diabetic, you can't tell them what to do. They're into fighting and they'll fight their way through the process. So these two personalities affect this blood sugar reaction in physiology and affects the beta cells and uh, the responding glucagon cells. And what's interesting, is they found out that when they did studies, they found out that dogs have high, more hypoglycemia and cats have more diabetes. Cats, you can't tell what to do, but dogs, you can tell them what to do. Another personality uh, correlation. So you'll find a correlation and it's based on the autonomics. And whenever you have a perception that's on defense, that you have a history where you perceive more challenges and supports in your life and you play you're a victim of your history and you're on defense, your blood sugar can be on defense, your blood sugar and your blood, um, pressure can actually go up and you can have a, literally a hypertension and you can have from that process, you can have blood, blood sugar, you can oxidize and accelerate the de degenerative processes, where on the other side you can calm things down and relax and have low blood pressure and low sugar levels and play the other side. So the personalities are definitely correlated with these uh, conditions. But it's primarily through the autonomics.
and it's primarily value driven. So anytime a person lives by their highest values and they feel that everything is on the way, not in the way, and they're grateful for their life, uh, they have the highest probability of bringing wellness to their body. But anytime they are not feeling that they can live according to their own values and they have expectations for them to live according to somebody else's ideals, and they are angry about life and they have expectations that aren't being met, they play out one of these personas. If they feel that they can fight or fight or flight it, they'll play out the diabetic side. If they feel that they can't, they'll play out the submissive side and they'll play out the hypoglycemic side. So our, our value systems are dictating how we act on the world, but it's also how we're perceiving the world relative to those value systems that are affecting our physiology. And I just use those as a classical example, but I went through, again, a thousand different health conditions and the autonomics related to it. You'll find out that every cell is responding, just about in the body, is responding to the autonomics and it may cause a dilation or a constriction of an artery or a blood vessel, or it may cause a pigmentation or a depigmentation in a cell, in a melan melanic, melanic cells. Whatever, whatever the cell function is, you can see that they'll be turned on or turned off by these autonomics. And there's deep unconscious motives in these autonomics that are driving these fun phenomenon. And if you understand the, how to ask the right questions, you can unveil what these things are. And in the process of doing it, you can understand what's initiating them. And many times when you get to the very core and you balance out the equation, some of these symptoms immediately stop uh, occurring. And uh, I have about 375 patients coming out of one uh, medical center out of just Calgary, Canada, I was just up there with, that has referred people for balancing out their perceptions and amazing results are there. But nobody's taking the time to ask these questions and they're just treating them with, with pharmaceuticals in many cases. Sometimes uh, the psychiatrists are, are asking a few questions, but mainly psychologists and therapists are asking these questions. But if they don't know how to ask the right question, they won't get to these cores and they just automatically kind of put them into a category. And there's a whole new field in the health field that I think deserves to be addressed. Um, dealing with these epigenetics, dealing with these psychophysiological responses, the psychoimmunological responses, and so that's what I've been pioneering for the last 40 years, the, that relationship, particularly in the cancer uh, area, because I like to define this cancer is one of, it activates, you, you find out, I used to be the president of the Cancer Prevention Control Association in Houston, and I worked with lots of different patients at cancer, worked with MD Anderson Hospital and, and St. Luke's Hospital, and I found that there were certain personality traits even in cancer patients, even the type of cancer and the type, and I found that they had all or none behavioral patterns. They, they talked and gave, revealed some of their cancers by perceptions like, I've always done this, my mother would never do that, my father was always this way, a lot of all, none, black, white perceptions. I was just in Tehran recently, uh, speaking with the government of Tehran, and we were discussing with one of the leading oncologists there, who has 5,000 patients, this very thing. The pathologist there was noticing some of the cellular responses, and we were discussing this. He's coming in to learn some of the methods I'm doing on how to balance out the perceptions and the physiology with the method I've developed, and they're working and trying to do some pilot studies on it. At the, at the Imperial College, they're doing research there on neurotransmitters and functional MRIs on this relationship. So we're making some inroads on it. But one thing I'm certain is if you live according to your highest values, you have the highest probability of having a balanced mind. When you inject the values of other people that you subordinate to and try to live somebody else's values, you automatically feel unfulfilled. And addictive behavior is a byproduct of unfulfilled highest values because we're looking for immediate gratification when we're not feeling fulfilled in our life. And that compensation makes us more volatile and makes us have perturbation and volatilities in our physiology, which we call disease. So I'll summarize it by saying that I believe that the symptoms of our body are feedback mechanisms, homeostatic mechanisms to reveal to our conscious mind what we haven't balanced in our perceptions and haven't loved and appreciated. It's trying to give us symptoms to know how to gain meaning to it so we can go back and look at things in a way where we can say thank you. And that's why gratitude and love are still the greatest healers on the planet. I always say a balanced mind opens the heart, makes you feel grateful, Gratitude opens the gateway of the heart, allows love to come out. When you have love, you bring about order and organization in the body. You have inspired mind, you have an enthusiastic body, and your body goes back into homeostasis and does its job and brings wellness instead of illness. How's that for a quick 30-minute presentation? <laughs> Did I hit 30 minutes on the money? I had to do what I could in 30 minutes. I know I went fast, but...
hopefully we stimulated ideas now. Now we can discuss. So looking from the personality profile, um, are there any of the, the profiles that you recognize by looking at them and see which disease patterns that these people show? For example, you said that there are people who have cancers. Yes. So are there particular uh, patterns that yes. suggest this is a, I mean, a, a tumor kind of situation? Or is this a physical disease? Uh, or is it a psychological disease? Are there any patterns that you can say that has been sort of confirmed to give you some guidelines? I can't say that they're absolutes because some of, our, some of them we don't have enough data to say. We have anecdotals, but um, the one thing you will find, I, I do a program pretty well every weekend called The Breakthrough Experience. I'm doing it here this weekend, in fact, at, uh, out here in Chicago. What is it called? Pardon me? What is the program called? It's called The Breakthrough Experience. What is it? And The Breakthrough Experience is designed to assist people in breaking through unrealistic expectations, limitations, fears, guilts, uh, any emotional baggage that's stopping them from doing something extraordinary with their life. But in that program, which I've done to tens of thousands of people in 60 countries now, um, I listened carefully to people's language and their language reveals a lot about what's going on. And, uh, just as Freud used to talk about Freudian slips, there are memes in our, in our psychology that are revealed by our linguistic expressions that give away a lot what's going on. But you'll find out in the cancer patients, you'll hear statements of absolutisms. There's, when we live according to our highest values, we have, because we embrace both sides and we're more likely to see both sides equally, we have more resilience and adaptability to a changing environment. But when we're down at the bottom of the, the value systems and we're striving for one side and trying to avoid the other side, things are white and black. And when there's white or good and black and bad, then we fear the loss of this one and we fear the gain of this one and we live in a lot of fear and guilt. <clears throat> so what we hear is absolute statements like always, never, uh, every time, never time. So extreme polarities instead of, uh, when somebody comes to me and they say, uh, well, Tuesday, my boyfriend uh, rejected me and I was upset. That's different than when somebody says, all men are evil. All men are always evil. That language is the kind of language you see in a reverberating uh, primitive cell response down at the cell level. Uh, we know that the cancers are activating what we could call ancient toolkits in cell uh, physiology and is bringing down back to what is called a metazoa tropoplastic level of expression. And um, this is where single cells started to work in clusters, but they started to not make an organ jet. But that, that junction point where it's a tumor that's just kind of like a scattered group of kind of anaploidic cells. These are activated in, in primitive stress responses that are not adaptable. So you'll find this language and it'll be around a wound in their life, a shock in their life, uh, something they had an expectation for that wasn't met or something that's not, that they're striving for that's not being met that is a historical pain in their life or fantasy in their life correlating with it. So what I do is I go in there and I listen to their language, identify what those all or nones are, identify what the emotional charge is that's initiated those and I go in there and I balance them out. So if I find that they're, if they say, well, my mother was always mean to me, my father was always nice, and I would never be like my mother ever again in my life, and she's always that way, and everybody I know said that about her, but I would never be like that. I'm always like my father, who's always kind to me. I would never be that mean, terrible person like my mother. Those are languages that have a tremendous amount of resentment stored up that's been shocked by the father, and an addictive behavior and a subordinate juvenile dependency on the father, which usually means it sets up unrealistic expectations in marriages towards the husbands, and it sets up a desire to not be controlled by the, by the mother and a defense mechanism there. So what I do is I go in and I use this language to identify the shocks, the extreme pains that are stored unconsciously in the brain um, that are running around and reverberating in the brain as brain noise, and I go in there and I idol itemize those, and then I ask a series of questions. What specifically did your mother do at this particular time? When and where was that? And where have you done that in your life? And I make them own the trade. What's the benefit of it? 
because you've seen a drawback without a benefit. Whenever you see a drawback without a benefit, it stores in a memory and it reverberates in there until you balance it. And it'll stay in there your whole life and it'll accumulate in there. So I go find out the benefit side. Then I go find out the benefits of who the people you've done it to, so you're not car carrying around shame and guilt. Then I find out where has this person done the opposite, so you break the labels on them. Then I find out at the moment your mom was basically mean to you, who was being nice to you to balance out the equation. Then I find out if your mother had been nice to you, what would have been the drawback to you? Because you may be holding on to a fantasy that if she'd been nice to you, life would have been better. But the real truth is if she'd been nice to you, you'd be dependent on her like you are your dad. So I go in and I neutralize these memories that are imbalanced, and the second I neutralize them until they brought to tears of gratitude for this person for what's happened and revamp their perceptions of it, they're storing those inside and those things are keeping the autonomics back in a primitive level. We know in the forebrain, when we're in a state of gratitude and love, the heart integrates with the brain, they phase lock together, they work as a unit, and the forebrain, the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex is activated, the governing system, the executive center, and you bring harmony to the body. But if not, if you're under extreme emotion, stored unconsciously in the past or present or consciously, then what happens is the amygdala goes in there, free runs and reverberates this cycle and re reactivates this, this uh, activation system. Then anything that reminds you of the original stress, boom, brings it up again. And you keep catalyzing the same primitive reaction again. And this catal catalysis of the same uh, reaction is what's initiating, uh, first promoting and then initiating some of these uh, reverberating systems. I went into the initial um, gene responses to stresses and you literally can, with epigenetics and transpositions and things, you can literally cause an activation and activation of the junk DNA, which is later now called regulatory DNA. That DNA is reactivated again, just like it was in the earlier primitive states and can actually activate this toolkit. So I've mapped out the mechanisms of how this can occur and how our perceptions can alter these, these genes and literally induce these, these so-called oncogene activities. They're similar as viral oncogenes. And even the viruses, and Arnold Amin at Princeton University showed that the second you're under this emotional state like this, you can literally print out viral replication systems for reverse transcriptase and viral replication that we once thought was the source of the cancer. We may actually be actually derivatively putting viruses out with the oncogenes. Not because the virus is doing it, but because we're doing it. The viruses are actually there coming out of it just as much as going in. He has a two-way street on that. So I believe that there's a psycho psychological component here and knowing how to access what those emotional states are and clearing them. I don't always know what that's going to clear, but once we know that they're cleared, it's benefit for the body because it's more resilient and adaptive. But what happens is symptoms start going down. We have people that all of a sudden, uh, while they go through and clear out all these pieces of baggage, while they're going through chemotherapy, all of a sudden their cancers accelerate uh, regress all of a sudden. And uh, if all of a sudden they have a major charge, they can progress again. You can see these correlations go on, but they're not being asked in oncology. They're just not being addressed because um, you're dealing with things that are not in their expertise or their training or their, or their time, because it's time consuming. So knowing how to ask the question, you'll find the patterns. And, and there are some patterns that are specific. Some breast cancers have certain patterns of not feeling nurtured, and they feel they had an expectation that was unmet dealing with nurturing. Could be father, could be mother, depending on the breast, but it's definitely there. And we see that also people that are having problems with the liver, many times they've had repetitively uh, unrealistic expectations. They're highly bitter and very angry and they're holding on to stuff. And they usually have hemorrhoidal problems and they have bowel problems and everything else that's precursing that. So you can see the, the physiology is causing dried, sympathetic, dominated bowels that are causing backup in the veins, toxicities in the veins, et cetera. You can see this history in precursing it. So if we don't ask the right questions, we'll never even explore this. But if we ask the right questions, so I've been interested in asking questions and eliciting responses and identifying it and correlating these things and documenting these things and putting it in this text. It's not a published text, it's mainly for my students. I'm doing um, that program in Houston, Texas again. I did it in South Africa, I'm doing it in Australia. Um, we usually have 100 to 150 uh, clinicians come and I address this for five days on just every one of the conditions and the psychology and the endocrinology, neurology. Uh, epigenetics, the entire process of how it might work. It's, it's my models, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get more and more clinical application of it. I've worked with thousands of cases, but I'd like to see more people utilizing it. That's why in Tehran, this oncologist will be very useful to me if he can start putting it in. We have psychiatrists using it, we have psychologists using it, we have medical doctors using it in London. We have many people already using it and getting amazing insights from this. So 
There is no doubt in my mind that there's a psychology, epigenetic, neurological correlation, and we're on the for frontiers of that area. This is where the future needs to go. In addition to the highly technological approaches and all the things we're learning, we need to have this part component also. Because I really believe that wellness, the cost of healthcare has gotten so high that people learning how to be wellness factored uh, is to their advantage, to know how to do whatever they can on the inside, to play their role in it, instead of just dissociating it from it and saying, now my doctor takes care of this, at least they can understand. And I really believe that understanding diseases of meaning and finding meaning in your disease is to your advantage. Because being angry at it and thinking it's caused by something out and dissociating from it is losing the power of what, you're offer, what these symptoms are offering us. They're giving us great insight. I hope this is making sense so far. Yes. yes. How does pain and the chronic pain and the location of the pain uh, has to do with this high value, low value? Because yes. um, my mom, she lives in South America, and every time we speak on the phone, she has pain. That's the start of the conversation. So I'm trying to see if there's uh, any. I, you, you're going to open up a hornet's nest here. First of all, there's, there's acute pain that is neurologically based, and then there is a chronic pain that is glial-based, glial-based pain. Glial-based pain has a hidden agenda in it. So anybody that's in pain chronically, that's usually a glial-based pain. Uh, let me give you a case on that. I was in the um, hotel in Dublin, Ireland. I was doing lectures in Dublin, and um, I had a patient that I worked with in the, after, in the evening, and um, she said, I've been living in pain my whole life, uh, one of those chronic pains, and um, you know, just in and out of different specialists, et cetera, chronic pain, chronic pain, chronic pain. And I asked her a simple question, something that nobody ever asked. So what's the benefit you're getting out of it? And she says, what do you mean the benefit of pain? How is there a benefit of pain? If you've never read a book by Milton Ward called The Brilliant Function of Pain, I believe every clinician would benefit by reading this. The Brilliant Function of Pain by Milton Ward. It's a simple little 80, 90 page book. I used to give it to every one of my patients that were complaining of pain. Uh, and it talks about how important it is to be able to feel pain. If you do not have pain, you got problems. So it's a, a benefit. So I asked the lady, what's the benefit of the pain? And she said, well, how could it be benefit of pain? I said, I, I know, but no one will continue to do something unless there's more advantage than disadvantage. So I said, well, so what's the benefit you're getting out of pain? She says, I can't think of it. I said, well, let's look again. Same thing. And as we started probing, we found out that she had a sister that was the superstar when she was very young. And she was the one that always got good grades and always got involved in sports and always got awards and this and that. And there was no way she can compete with her sister because she was not the bright one. And so the only way she could do it is get injured and have sympathy and pain mechanisms. So she spent her whole life using pain for attention and to get things accomplished, and it was working. And every time she'd get into pain, mommy would go, boo boo, here, let me take care of you, and she'd get ice cream, and she'd get places, and she'd go this, and get all these things accomplished through pain. Some people are stoics, and some people are pusillanimous people that use their, their avoidance of pain or seeking of pain in order to get their outcomes. So when I see a chronic pain, um, there's a, there's a glial function there, and a glial function is, it goes back to value systems. So I immediately ask, what's the benefit you're getting out of it? Is this the way of keeping your, sis, your daughter calling you on a regular basis? Is this making sure that you keep your family together because they feel sorry for you, and you haven't figured out any other strategy, and maybe when you were really bitching when you were younger, they all dispersed to other parts of the world, and they didn't want to be around you, but when you came up with a serious illness or pain, then you found a strategy in order to get what you want, to keep your kids calling you and keeping in touch with you? You always have to find out what the benefits. This lady, when we found out the benefits, she broke down in tears and found out all the things. And she said to me, she said, do you re remotely think I could go to this extreme and create this kind of pain for this period of time and to get these benefits? I said, absolutely. And she cried and she says, I can't believe I would do that to myself. I said, I believe it. I've seen it all, I've seen it all over the world. I said, I said, right now, now that you're having these awarenesses, what's your pain level? She says, right now it's dropped significantly. I said, okay. Right now, you're having a deep insight. If we can find out all the benefits of the pain and find alternative ways of getting those benefits without having to use the strategy of pain, we can reduce the pain levels. Are you with me on this? Now, the second thing we want to ask, um, it's really interesting. If you close your eyes and ask a person to give me the district description of the pain, and I say, well, tell me about your pain. What color is it? They'll say black or red. 
Okay, is it moving or is it stagnant? Uh, it's slow moving. Okay, does it have a smell? Yes, it's putrid. Um, is it to the left or right? And I start asking visually, auditory, smell, taste, and 104 other senses. I start asking what are all the modalities and some of the distinctions of the pain? And I itemize them all out. And then what I do is I take a complementary opposite description. Uh, if it's red, I'll take, it, I'll take its complementary color, uh, blue maybe. If it's something slow, I'll speed it up. If it's dark, I'll make it light. I'll take this complementary opposite and have them close their eyes and see a complementary opposite. I'll put it in a little round circle or a box. I'll put their pain in a box. And then I'll slam them together inside the mind like a particle accelerator and completely integrate those two pairs. And the moment they're integrated and I show them the opposite, and I put them together and slam them together and find out and put them completely together until they can't see or hear the other one, their pain levels can drop up to 80 to 90%. We used to do this on oncology patients with osteosarcoma that had intractable pain on their legs and hips and, and their femurs. And they would all of a sudden, they wouldn't be able to walk or anything. And we would drop their pain like 80%. Because it's the stacked up associations through the glial function that's actually part of the pain mechanism. Because a person can walk on hot coals, like a Tony Robbins seminar, they can walk on hot coals and not feel 1800 degree temperature, can they? And walk out without burning their feet, but if they're in the right state of mind, because they have the ability to override this. So pain, as John Bonica said in his research many years ago, who was a private, he said it's a private sensation of hurt. The objectivity of pain is very variable and it's hard to define, but we know that there's associations of brains that can turn on and turn it off. We know the Melzac wall gate theory used to be able to, we'd scratch something to reduce the pain because it could shut off the gate pathways. But we also know that higher centers can override the pain sensation and give it a different perception. And these glial cells are either supporting or challenging us. And if we have enough benefits for keeping the pain, we'll keep it as a chronic pain. If not, we'll shut it down. You all know people, they usually marry each other. One basically minimizes the pain, one exaggerates the pain. The minimizer, you know, can have broken limbs and won't just say, that's ah, no big deal. And the exaggerator will go, oh my God, I'm, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna go. They're hypochondriacs. One seduces, reduces the pain, one exaggerates the pain. They're different personality types. And we have the capacity to literally suppress or express those. And it's amazing how we find people that are extreme pain, all of a sudden their boyfriend comes over and they all of a sudden get back to the pain later. They, they have a reason to override it. So we have amazing mechanisms to associate or dissociate from pain or pleasures. And um, we have motives for this. That's why glial cells are so important in the pain and chronic pain syndromes. But you always gotta ask what's the benefit. I guarantee you can take somebody here with extreme pain and ask them the benefits, get them past their initial uh, resistance on it, ask them a question, keep asking a question, come up with 75 benefits, and I guarantee you their pain level will drop in front of your eyes 75 to 50% minimum in literally 30 minutes. And they won't be able to feel their pain. They go, what happened to my pain? Because it's, a, as Anaxagoras 2,600 years ago said, he was a Thales derivative student, a pre-Socratic philosophy, he says that pain and pleasure are lopsided perceptions in the human mind. So if you ask the right questions, you can change the ratios of perceptions, you change the, the tolerance of pain, and they're transmitter based. And the thalamic and the, the, the higher cortical levels can override the thalamic responses to pain from the primitive uh, part of the input from the nociceptive fiber, see fibers coming up the brain. So you can literally override that with perceptions. I do it, and I'm talking about acute pains. I saw a person in um, Houston, Texas, that ripped the top of their foot off getting out of a, uh, a table, underneath the table, ripped it, they had their foot under a table without realizing the lock was there, and they caught it, and they ripped the top of the skin off their foot, bleeding everywhere. We put the skin back on there, and we immediately used her as an example. They went and got ice while they're doing it. I said, let's do the process. We got an acute situation. Let's follow the process right there. The speed in which her healing occurred, once we neutralized that and took out the pain, she couldn't comprehend it. Her husband writes for the Calgary Herald Science Report. He's a noted scientist. He's never seen anything like it. He says, I, 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 our normally that would have taken seven to 10 days to heal and be the, the, the scab to come off. That thing was gone in four days. The, the response of healing has a lot to do with your perception. So if you can find meaning and benefit in whatever happens to you, even in acute injuries, you can speed up the process of the healing process because your immune system is not under a stress response and it allows it to, to function better. So balancing out the mind is probably the greatest healer I've seen as far as a psychological component. So uh, what I get is, so what I gather is, 
that uh, if I So what I gather is that it is, uh, if I could give you an example of uh, uh, required to a steering. So the consciousness, conscious, so our self-conscious is the, your steering, you know. If you bring everything into the conscious and then... Balance add, it. Uh, and then balance it. You know, Override and, the unconscious. Yeah, and so that is your steering. You, you are controlling it. So it's a self-control. Yeah, let me, let me, can I address that for a second? Yeah. Let me address that. You don't want to get me started. You get me started, I'll go all night. Okay. You have a set of values. And when you meet somebody next to you that supports your values, if you put them on a pedestal, uh, here's your highest value. If you put them on a pedestal and somebody supports your values, you'll open up to them, you'll be vulnerable and gullible to them, and you'll inject their values into your life. Anybody that you infatuate with, put on a pedestal, or make an author of you that you admire and look up to, um, you can become dependent on, a juvenile dependent on them, and they can end up injecting their values into you. Freud called it the superego. The superego is the internalization of an authority figure's values into your life. And the second you inject the authority figure's values into your life, you now have a conflict within yourself between your own conscious and the unconscious. So the second you inject an authority figure's value, you create a superego. Your own higher value, which you normally make decisions with, go unconscious. But now you're consciously trying to be living according to this, this person you admire. So now you create and make decisions that are based on unconscious. Because your decisions are based on your highest value, but you're attempting on the outside to live by somebody else's value, right? We've all been infatuated with somebody when we first meet somebody, yes? In a relationship, you meet somebody, you put them on a pedestal, and you, stopped, you stop doing what you normally do that's important to you, and you start doing things that you think are important to them and you start sacrificing what you normally do to be with him. When you do, you internally judge yourself if you're not doing what you expect yourself to do according to their values. What happened, you have internal conflict, a moral dilemma sits inside you. So you're striving to be yourself, but you're trying to be somebody other than yourself. Now this consciousness and this unconscious, this unconscious will keep making decisions, but you'll stride, try to override your unconscious but your unconscious will keep making decisions. That's why I always, I don't go by what people say, I go by what their life demonstrates. Because their life demonstrates and their physiology demonstrates what's going on. But their outside facades and personas and masks, they cover up their being with, because this is their being here, that's their ontological identity. This is their masks that you're wearing. So when you're living according to somebody else's values, you feel proud, when you don't, you feel shamed, and these masks of pride and shame are the diabetic and hypoglycemic. When they're brought back, and we break the infatuation with this person or the resentment to the person, we automatically bring them into balance and we bring the conscious and unconscious together again. And once the conscious and unconscious are one, normal well wellness re presumes again. But we've stacked up hundreds and hundreds of different emotional things throughout our life and they just compound on top of each other. And the various combinations of those compounding is what's leading to some of these diseases in our physiology. We like to think it's just a, a germ out there that causes it, but the germs are basically the byproduct. Just like if you've got a dirty house, you get the germs. You've got a clean house, the germs leave you alone. Same thing in the body. The body has amazing capacities. At one time, they used to think that you wanted to have a, uh, an intestines that were cleared out of all the bacteria. Now they realize the microbiome and the intestines are essential for various uh, health conditions. And we know that the autonomics are governing which bacteria turn on and turn off, and which ones migrate and grow. And, and uh, the permeability of the intestinal wall and autoimmune diseases are all related to autonomic functions. So a lot of these diseases are psychologically correlate. Uh, most people are, because they haven't delved into this in depth, they don't see a cause and effect relationship. But if you see what I see every week and having people dissolve emotional baggage that they accumulate and they clear it and then they start reporting symptoms just disappearing right there on the spot that day and the next day gone that they've had for years you can't ignore that it just keeps happening week after week after week so 
Keeping records of that is what allows us to get data accumulating on um, these various unconscious motives that are sitting inside the mind-body relation. Can you write a good example of uh, when the doctor tells the patient who the beads and said lose the weight, and they start to do that for a few days, and then afterwards, slowly they go back to eating the normal thing, and when they come back to the physician's office and say, well, uh, you're supposed to lose weight. Oh well, yeah, I'm doing everything I can. No, no, no. I know what I'm doing. So the thing is, the internal conflict in their own mind, they think they're losing the weight, no, 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 no. There's way more than just uh, telling somebody to do something. Um, I have an addiction process that I've developed that I use. And um, when a person's addicted to something, whether it be overeating or whether it be a drugs or sex or whatever it may be, um, they're getting unconscious benefits out of doing that activity. If you just go in there and telling them to stop doing it, that's useless. Uh, if you tell them it's, it's causing them problems, that doesn't mean anything. But if you go in there and identify first all the benefits they're getting and bringing unconscious motives to the conscious level without judging them. There's no judgment on them, just you're identifying it so they're understanding why they're doing what they're doing. Because they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't getting unconscious benefits out of it. And stack those up until they actually have real cathartic realizations about it. Then what we do is we tend and come up with viable alternative ways of getting those same benefits. Because if they don't have an alternative way of getting those same benefits, they're going to keep doing that to get those benefits. We get alternative, viable alternatives. Now what we do is we link that to their highest values by a question, how specifically is these new behaviors going to help you fulfill your highest values? And we stack up hundreds and hundreds of links to make sure we have neuroplastic change. Then we go in there and take the original addiction and we go, how is that now interfering with your highest values? And we now associate pain with it. We have to stack up new viable alternatives uh, benefits, hundreds and hundreds of them, and then hundreds of the drawbacks there. Now we go over there and we, as, after we stacked up the new pathway, and uh, undermine the old pathway where neuroplastic will alter the brain. Now we go in there and go through their life and identify every single time that they've had a perception of something, we find the opposite to balance it. Because anytime they've got an imbalanced perception, the more imbalanced it is, the more they feel futile in life, and the more they, they're basically trying to live by fantasies, which kept perpetuating these addictive behaviors. So I, I have a whole 13 steps that I go through when we work with people over a two week period to clear out addictions of various forms whether they be eating or not. So just telling them to go home and change their diet means nothing. You're wasting your time. We have one final question. Yes. Thank you very much. I learned a lot in uh, an amazing short period of time. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it seems to me everything you're saying has tremendous implications for religious people. Yes. Um, you know, you can imagine someone who's in prison, believe, you know, live, they've lived a dissolute life, self-centered, criminal behavior, and they find a God. Uh, especially a God that they believe is merciful and expects high things from them. I could, you can imagine how these, you know, I, I, I heard of them many times, prison conversions, people going from extreme evil to extreme goodness and probably changing their health along the way. So would you agree? Um, let me address uh, religious constructs here. Uh, some of what I'm going to say is probably going to be supportive and some challenging to, to belief systems, but that's just my nature. Um, I believe inherently inside every human being, uh, there is, as scientists have called patternicity and agenticity, they have a desire to find the hidden order in the daily events and to find, um, because of our nature, we tend to want to communicate with things that relate to us. We, we relate to things in a human form, so we tend to create an agenticity, a personification of it. So there is an anthropomorphic component to our yearning to find order in behavior and in our activities, which is uh, kind of a pseudo anthropomorphic religious construction. And then there is what I'm going to call a true intelligence and true order of the universe that transcends all our anthropomorphisms, all of our limitations of what it is. I personally believe that there is inherent order in the universe. And whether you personify that or don't personify it, I think it's there. And it is, as Albert Einstein used to say, it is enough for me on a daily basis to explore um, the intelligence that permeates the universe and to participate in its, in its expression on a daily basis. He said true religiosity is the realization of the divine nature, the divine order, the divine perfection, the divine beauty that is ever present, that humans in their incomplete awarenesses tend to judge and to evaluate. And so we, we go around and we see things as terrible 
But then a day, a week, a month, a year, five years later, we find there's terrific in it. And we think these things are terrific, and then a day, a week, a month, a year, five years later, we find terrible in it. But inherently, it's always ordered. In, in Islam, we call it submission to Allah, in a sense. Submission means to not impose your evaluation onto Allah's divine plan. We go around and we tend to think that's good or that's bad, but that's our limited understanding. And in truth, it's basically hidden order. And I believe that that hidden order exists. And if we know how to ask the right questions, we can take things that support or challenge our values and ask and see the opposite, balance out the equation. Our physiology is brought back into order. And if we're in a prison and we're having chaos and we're in judgment of ourselves and other people and we're angry, and all of a sudden somebody introduces something like a divine order or a divine beauty or divine love, uh, call it Allah if you will, if you all of a sudden take that and embrace that and you set your mind free of the judgments, your physiology will do a miracle. But it's not really a miracle. It only is a miracle to people who don't understand how it works. But I believe that there's a divine order. And I believe that if we ask the right question, we can reveal it in our own daily life. And it's not based on faith. There's a knowing, there's a way of knowing that divine order is there, which gives us certainty. I always say humbleness to divinity is what provides certainty for humanity. And the person is really understanding it. Not because, if you're defensive about it, you don't really, you don't have certainty about it. And when you have certainty about it, there's no defense. There's just knowing, there's gratitude, there's love. There's appreciation for the order of the universe. So I've heard, you know, in the first surah of the Quran, I've always thought of it as that we're here to be submissive to Allah, not to impose our evaluations on Allah. And the Allah represents the divine order, divine love, the divine presence, the divine essence of our existence. And if we are basically able to see both sides equally, just like in nature, there's predator and prey, and neither one of them is good and bad. They're both necessary for the ecosystem. So too in our life, the things that support and challenge us, if we see them from the highest values, we see them equal. We do, we embrace life as it is, not impose our fantasies about how it's supposed to be. When we impose our unrealistic expectations, we get angry at life and we're then telling God, Allah what to do. But if we're humble and we see the order and we're thankful, we say thank you to Allah on a daily basis and then we basically see the order. Our power to heal is maximal in that state, in my opinion. So I don't think religion meant to re-ligate the ions of perception in our own life. And I think that that is the power that we have access to. So I don't think we can separate healing from religion. I think they're one and the same thing. True religion, anyway. Uh, who is on on high value uh, status and he have a full power and he, a, he have a full power power of his uh, full power uh, full power of his being yeah how he can benefit to the society to get any information which one he can use into the constructive way and into the into the destructive way so what will be the relation between the high value person and, and the powerful person. They're one and the same. So let me do one more thing if I can. Do I have a moment? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, when you, this is you, your highest value, you embrace both sides. When somebody supports your values, you tend to sacrifice yourself for them, minimize yourself for them, and put them on a pedestal. When somebody challenges your values, you tend to exaggerate yourself, minimize them, and put them in the pit. When you are humble and you're exaggerating them, you're willing to sacrifice you for them and you're ungrateful for you because you've injected their value. And so you have ingratitude when you judge somebody above you. When you are resentful to somebody, you put them down and you exaggerate yourself. You're willing to them to change and so you're now resentful to them and ungrateful for them. So anytime you infatuate with somebody and put them above you or put them below you, then you're automatically ungrateful for you relative to them or ungrateful for them relative to you. Therefore, anytime you have an imbalanced mind, an inequity of mind, you have ingratitude. And ingratitude is hell. That's a hell of a life. Because you're expecting yourself to live in their values, which is not going to happen. You're expecting them to live in your values, which is not going to happen. And you're having futility. And you're now imposing your own judgments. You're not having submission to Allah. You're having your expression of your own individuality imposed onto divinity, trying to tell divinity what to do. That's hell. That Full uh, talk. I have never learned that much information in an hour. 
So thank you very much. And this is a small gift from American Islamic College. Oh, wow, thank you. You know, this is a brew, uh, water marbling. Wow. Yeah, we do it. Uh, this is original. And uh, you will remember us when you see this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for There's only time. one problem. Is it possible, I would be glad to pay for it, can I have this sent to Houston? Because I'm course, traveling, I won't course, go back to yeah. my office. Of course, yeah, we can do I that. I can't travel with it. Of course, yeah. You can give the address to Romana. Can I do that? Because I would love to have that in my office, but I'm going from here to Phoenix, to Australia, to Africa, to Europe. I don't, I don't, I keep traveling. Okay, thank you again. And I can't travel with the plane. So I would be, I hope I don't dis course, disrespect yeah. you for that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the next talk is on May 22nd. Uh, Ms. Hind Maki will be speaking on how to give an A-plus presentation on Islam 101. Thank you very much. Excellent.